Okay, ready? Thank you, everyone. Sorry? Thank you, everyone, for coming to my session. I thought that I would probably be standing here alone because uh, everyone is already mentally on the way to the booth crawl and uh, thinking about what to do with the evening, go to the bar or whatever. So I find it interesting and I find it gratifying that storage does attract a uh, crowd, that storage does, is seen as important, is seen as the basis of what we are doing. I, every time I've worked in the storage capacity at different companies, there's always those people who say, well, networking is interesting, compute is interesting, storage is something that is around and uh, we shout at people when it doesn't work. So, in OpenStack, of course, there's a number of competing, of, uh, competing companies and competing projects who are trying to get their foot on the ground and who are trying to make inroads on providing the storage infrastructure for OpenStack. And two of those projects I want to look at a little bit closer today. One is Ceph, that's uh, sort of a newcomer. It's not an OpenStack project, but it's very well integrated with OpenStack. It has a very good reputation and deservedly so. And then there's Swift, it's the incumbent. It's been around for quite some time and it's seen by a lot of people as uh, boring and staid and uh, it's not, you know, it's sitting around and uh, it's not, Ceph has all those, it, it can, like a chameleon, it can take all kinds of different colors. It can become a file system, it can, be, it can become block storage or it can become object storage. Swift cannot do that, but Swift has a number of features which we will see on this talk that are important and uh, that make it or give it a uh, deserved place in your OpenStack cloud. So why is this even a question? Every time I go to a customer, almost every time, they have a pretty good idea of that one of them, one of the projects is cool, the other one is not. And, but this customer thinks it's Swift, that customer thinks it's F. And so what, we do, what do we do? Then I would like to talk about the customer's view because um, my, talk, my task at Mirantis is to go to customers, to look at their infrastructure, to listen to their business and use cases, to talk to the people who are later on going to deploy and run the cloud, and uh, to determine what we can do to make the cloud more useful and better for the enterprise. How do you go about choosing one? We'll, I'll talk about some core capabilities and drawbacks of each project and uh, about uh, advice, give some advice on what to look for when you're looking for a storage solution for a specific project. And then finally, and this is a pet project of mine right now, I've been working on an idea of combining the capabilities of both uh, so you would not have to choose between those. This is specifically important for larger environments, environments that span multiple data centers and that have uh, rather dissimilar hardware for the per data center, but we'll get to that later. Why is this even a question? My very recently I went to a customer, a customer told me, well, we, we are going to use Ceph. My first question, as almost always in this case, is what does drive that? Why, why are we doing that? Uh, what got you the idea of using Ceph? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just uh, saying we should look at where you came from, what your environment is, and how we can best support that. Starting with selecting a project over another project or starting with selecting a specific technology over another technology gets you probably a beautiful cloud. The problem with it is that it may not fit your business case. And if it doesn't, the people up there are going to be mad and they are going to cut off your fund funding or they are going to scream at you or both. And so uh, we should ask ourselves the question, why are we doing that? What, what are we doing? One of the solutions is always a waste of time. 
we have uh, Swift. Swift is not cool. And more often than not, uh, people say uh, Ceph is the better project because Ceph can do so many things. But do we really need all that? Answer is not yes or no. The answer is look at your business cases. Look at your use cases. What are you going to do with it? Is, for instance, this feature in Ceph necessary? Is this something that we actually are using? Is this something that can be worked around? Do you have to work around problems in your chosen solution? That's another biggie because working around problems usually is very expensive and it's just very uh, difficult to implement and oftentimes leads to contention. Technical specs and use cases. Every time I go to a customer, the first way is back to the basics. What's driving us is the money. The money says Mirantis is cool. Uh, Mirantis is helping us doing this. But uh, we need to look at what the money really wants, what the money really needs, what the company really needs to determine whether we, what, what approach we choose to get into this design. Any design that we build serves a purpose, and the purpose is not to be a nice play toy for uh, operators. The purpose is not, not even to be the best storage money can buy. The purpose is we, are, we want to do something specific with it. Does our solution support that? And again, working around drawbacks is expensive. We can't say that often enough. Customers have tried it time and again. Well, we'll script something. This is a, uh, the sentence, well, we'll script something. This is something that I hear frequently and that usually leads to pretty big problems. Scripting is cool. Scripting is useful in certain uh, events. You, for instance, you have something that you simply cannot do with your with either of the current solutions, and you choose the, the solution that fits best and work around the drawbacks of that. But uh, scripting, just because you have chosen something and you don't, don't know whether it's the actual best way to do things, you just uh, approach it from a, well, we can do that way, is going to cause pretty big problems down the road. So what do we do with storage? And this is a point that probably most of you are familiar with. We, of course, we support the cloud functionality itself. We have uh, block storage. We have image storage. Who here is uh, working extensively with uh, Glance and Cinder? Nobody? So what, what backend do you choose for Glance, for Cinder, why, and why do you choose that? Uh, we have our own custom implementation. I work for Rascal. Oh, go <laughs> So you're probably just here to uh, figure out whether, whether what I'm saying is nonsense, and you can, uh, can say, hey, this guy, <laughs> this guy has, uh, doesn't have it down. OK, so but uh, it's, it's important to think about that, because for instance, we have, uh, I had a customer pretty recently, and I'm going to actually, let's see, we have a customer's perspective here. This is a, a fictional uh, setup, but it is relatively close to what uh, a specific customer told me. So let's say our company, Megacorp, has three main data centers, big data centers. They have a lot of storage there. They have a lot of compute nodes. They have all kinds of neat technology. They have uh, networking, everything down. and they have, one of the important things is they have multiple storage devices and they need to be in sync. I put something in on one side and it needs to show up on the other, on the other two sides. If you do that in the wrong way, this is going to cause a pretty a big amount of problems. So the in this case, uh, the consumption and the supply of data has to be looked at, and we have to figure out how to get the data that we are supplying in one place to the consumer on the other side. And we also need an object store for application. Maybe we need a, a file system store 
it really depends on the application. But let's say we only need uh, to support our cloud and we need to su uh, support the object storage. And then they have satellite data centers. They are small data centers. They have a few compute nodes. They have a few, uh, uh, they have a few storage nodes. And the storage nodes can, they not, it's not high performance storage. It also may not be uh, the, the network link between the main data centers and the satellite data centers may be very slow. And of course, in with uh, projects like that, the cost is the driving factor. It can't be too expensive. So no going to NetApp and having them cart a couple of fast 8080s in there with a number of big shelves and we are just copying everything down. The network is very slow between here and there. Let's just copy everything down and provide it locally. If you try that, of course, uh, the, there's going to be a number on the bill from NetApp and this number is going to, be, to have a lot of, of zeros in the wrong place. And then they are, you're going to talk to management and management is going to say, uh, hey, I didn't tell you to buy something for that much money. So you have to find an open source project that you can actually substitute for the big expensive storage. By the way, I'm not saying that big expensive storage is better than uh, an open source approach. I'm just saying that it has its place in uh, storage too, and it is something that we need to take into account. So, so this is our mega core cloud project. We have big storage here, here, here. These are the big data centers. And we have our little satellite data center with the little storage buckets all around. And we have no way to in any way combine them. So what would you think if we have a setup like this? How should we go about that? Any ideas? How do, we, how do we select the project that will work with us to support a setup like this? We want to have all our, uh, our data in all these three data centers in perfect sync. And we want to have the necessary data in, this, uh, in these little data centers that are uh, set aside. So what you could do is you could do the Swift approach. You have story, uh, you have storage everywhere. You have to have the same amount of storage everywhere, at least the amount of storage that you have to have to store your complete data set. And so this means that your satellite data centers are going to balloon out. And we are also going to have a lot of network traffic going from everywhere to everywhere. And then what you're doing here is rather, let's say, useless because you have uh, only a requirement for a very small subset, a few percent of your total data set. And you have this, this subset may be different from this subset and this subset. And what you want to achieve is to have only the storage there or the, the data there that you actually need for your uh, relative local use case. So another approach, of course, and this is the one that I have seen time and again, customers take is, okay, we'll just copy the stuff more or less manually over there. It certainly works if the data set is small enough, you can script that somehow, put it together, make it, uh, make it work for you somehow. The downside to that is it's not standardized. And if the guy who has written the script leaves the company, which is uh, nowadays is something that you have to take into account with the job market the way it is and um, uh, the, the scarcity of, of uh, good IT engineers. Um, and nobody will understand how it works anymore and it will work for another three or four or five months and then it will break. And then there's going to be a number of very unhappy operators who are sitting there three nights in a row for trying to figure out how to make this thing work again. And the developers are going to sit on the back end and say, uh, we need this new image here and this is, uh, it sucks that the image is not there. So they are going to yell at you. You don't want to be yelled at, at least I don't want to be yelled at, I don't know how we do. So this is clearly not the solution that we are looking for. Let's look at the Ceph approach. Ceph has two different ways to support 
uh, Cinder and Glance, which is one of which is um, Rados Gateway, meaning you have an object store again. And the other one is uh, RBD, which means you use a block store to uh, provide your backend for Cinder and Glance. The block store does not really replicate at all. There's no inbound, in built-in functionality that allows you to replicate an RBD store to another data center. With Rados Gateway, you can do that. The problem with Rados Gateway is that you have a master and a slave. You cannot write into the slave. You have to have a master. So if you want to write into each of your data centers, you have to have a master there that's replicated to the slave somewhere else. And it's also replicated to one of those little satellite data centers. And then, of course, Rados Gateway has a couple of other disadvantages. One of them is that uh, all the nice advantages that you were hoping to draw from Ceph RBD, like copy on write, do not work with Rados Gateway for good reason. This is the same reason why, why, why you cannot do that with Swift, at least not at the moment, as far as I am aware. If I'm mistaken about that, and with the, temp with the speed everything is moving, uh, I, it, must, it must have been a very new development. So we have in Swift, we have multi-region capability. Maintenance, in my opinion, is less complicated than it is in Ceph. If you have uh, ever tried to troubleshoot a Ceph cluster, it, is, it can be pretty grueling. Um, it's a simple to firewall off because uh, Swift has like a Rados gateway also has uh, proxy servers in front of it. So you, have, so you can simply uh, put a firewall in front of those and only let the protocols that you absolutely need inside, which is probably um, HTTPS, possibly HTTP, uh, through that firewall. And everything else is, uh, is blocked off. If you use Ceph and RBD, you cannot really do that because the compute nodes have to talk to the uh, OSDs directly. So you have to have a lot more ports open, even if you have a firewall between those two entities. On the flip side, of course, what does a proxy do? It passes traffic through, it comes in, it goes out again. So you are introducing an element of latency and also probably a performance bottleneck if you have too much traffic going, th going on through there. So, um, okay, this is, this is actually an error. This is supposed to be, to be, uh, to, to be RBD. So I didn't proofread, right? And of course, you have uh, object storage with Rados Gateway, you have block storage with uh, RBD, and you have file storage with CephFS. And you also have the opportunity to write whatever tickles your fancy for uh, as an additional plugin. You have RBD has a number of uh, big advantages, uh, which one of which is copy on write, uh, which is uh, very useful if you like to spawn hundreds of instances from a single uh, boot image, and uh, only the differences are get, get stored, which uh, is very useful to keep your small data center small. In Swift, if you have the backend, uh, you have to make a copy for each of them and uh, each of the instances, and uh, so you, the thing balloons much earlier. And then we have um, erasure coding. Erasure coding is an interesting way of uh, avoiding replication and avoiding the, the, the disadvantages of having the three copies of each piece of storage that is uh, in your data, data store. Normally, erasure coding is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 times the uh, data that you have, your total, total usable data. And on the, this is the, the advantages, it's about as safe as having three copies with half the storage. But uh, it is currently, even if you ask the safe people, erasure coding is not quite uh, stable enough for full-on production use yet. At least this is the last status that I have from, a, from about a month ago. So you don't want to risk that, but uh, of course for a, a dev cluster that doesn't really matter all that much. Ceph architecture overview, I think most of you have probably seen that already. You have um, Librados is the, uh, the basis of pretty much everything. 
You have the Rados gateway on top of that. The Librados uh, communicates with the uh, uh, OSDs and with the, mo uh, with the uh, I'm fat fingering the, the remote a lot today. And so uh, you're talking, Librados talks directly to the, can talk directly to the OSDs and the monitors. The monitors are an interesting uh, component of the Ceph cluster in that they have a quorum. If you have uh, Swift, you do not have a quorum between your proxy servers. You can have as many or as few as you want, and uh, you, they are independent of each other. They're also stateless, so you can add, add pro, uh, proxy servers or remove proxy servers during operation. In Ceph, these monitors are stateful, and they, are, uh, they have a quorum. So if you have, for instance, three monitors and you lose two monitors, then you cannot access the cluster uh, until you uh, repair at least one of your monitors. You, can, uh, you don't lose any data with that. It's just uh, you have to take into account that you may incur downtime if you lose too many monitors. So it, is, it makes sense to spread them out and to, to design them uh, in an HA way. And of course, you have your OSDs with storage devices. There's another component that's not in this uh, piece of graphic, and also I have no idea why this comes out as this ugly brown. It's supposed, it's supposed to be uh, more dark red than brown. In any case, um, the storage devices are usually spinning storage, and spinning storage is slow. So if you write with uh, Ceph, you have to wait until you get a quorum back from your right. You have, uh, you get, have like, if you write uh, three copies, you have to have th uh, two copies written to disk. So what a lot of people do is put another layer in between there and uh, do, do a journaling, put a journaling device that is uh, SSD so you uh, speed up uh, write performance. And then you can have a separate cluster network where the replication is going through the, uh, the replication is going from one storage device to another. Swift, external network, you can have multiple regions and this is a multi-region Swift cluster. You have a load balance uh, uh, in there. You have a Swift proxy layer and you have a, a physical or virtual storage network and you have behind that you have uh, storage nodes. There is Ceph by now uh, it allows you to do caching, although also that is also not quite production grade yet, as I am told. Uh, Swift does not, so you basically uh, your speed is pretty much limited to what your uh, storage devices can do. So what do we do to en enhance speed? We put more storage devices because the more pieces are spread over the more uh, over more storage devices, the less time you will uh, spend reading an individual piece from an individual storage device. How do they integrate an OpenStack? Backend for Cinder, of course, you have, can either have RBD or Rados Gateway. Most installations use RBD, at least from my experience. Uh, in Swift, you have an object store. There's nothing really that you can uh, say about it. The, the object store is the back end and um, Cinder and Glance are fairly well optimized to work with this object store. File storage does not exist in Swift. There are some projects that are trying to put file storage on top of a Swift cluster, but as far as I know, none of them has uh, production grade software at the moment. And object storage for applications, we have Rados Gateway and an object store. And what's also missing is, of course, you can have an, uh, 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 storage devices, block storage devices for the application, also only in Ceph. So if you look at our Megacorp again, should say Megacorp up there, we have requirements. One of them, of course, is multi-region. We have the multi-region application, and this is something that management is not going to compromise on. We have a limited budget, especially for those uh, storage pods. We have a slow network to some remote sites. We have to take that, take that into account. And the local performance requirements are significant, so we want something that is not too, too slow. And then reliability and maintainability. So my idea to address this issue is to combine both approaches to your advantage. 
If you have a, the SEF approach, you have something that is fast and that is, uh, that, that is very good at local storage, but it's not very good at multi-region. And you have SWIFT, which is slower and which um, has its own operational disadvantages, but it is very good at multi-region. And for your central store, you don't really need something that is super fast. You normally don't pull uh, hundreds of thousands of images out of that uh, every minute of every day. You just pull images out every once in a while. Uh, some developer comes up with something new. And whether that takes a few seconds, it doesn't really matter all that much, as long as you can do that in an automated way. But uh, one of the important pieces, of course, is resilience. You have to have uh, reliable infrastructure. Otherwise, you'll have uh, run into big problems, both with the developers that you're talking to and with the uh, uh, with your operators. And Ceph is almost the mirror image of that. Ceph is almost the mirror image of that. It's fast. It is very good at local. It is not good at global at all. And, uh, but it can provide, still provide a local object store and file store. So you do not have to have multiple clusters locally. Imagine you, you want some, something that is, or have something that is only an object store and something that is only a, a block store. In this case, you can combine that. And you can, can combine it in an elastic way, which is also an advantage of Ceph that I haven't mentioned yet. You, have a, you can uh, share one Ceph cluster between object store and block store. And you, will not, you don't have to decide which part of the cluster is going to be object and which part is block. You have a, an elastic boundary between those two. So this is the happy approach that I've been thinking about, which is you have a Swift cluster that exists only in the three major data centers and that is used to infuse the uh, images, the uh, snapshots, everything that you want to keep permanently and want to uh, disseminate to your, uh, to your clients in a controlled way. And a Swift is not the best, highest performance solution. Um, even in the big data centers, I would uh, adv uh, advise having a small Ceph cluster that is used as high performance storage and also draws from Swift uh, to Im improve your, the uh, number of operations per second that you can do or the number of instances that you can launch in a given amount of time. And of course, we have Ceph clusters in those uh, remote regions. So the, the one thing that is missing from this picture is the glue, these blue lines. This is something that we do not really have yet. There's three different approaches that I would like to um, recommend for this, or the uh, approaches that we should consider for an um, integrated approach that we have here. We have scripted replication, of course. This is something that is a quick and dirty hack, and for a dev cluster, it would probably work just fine, but uh, it is probably not very well maintainable in the long run, and it is certainly something that you eventually, the tribal knowledge that created the scripts will dissipate over time, and then you're going to be saddled with something that you cannot really control. The second approach that you could do is orchestration. So let's just imagine we have a local Ceph cluster, and we have glance, and glance says to the local Ceph cluster, retrieve image, M image X, and uh, image X is not there. So we uh, should have, an, or the orchestrator would know to go to the Swift cluster, retrieve the image, insert it into the local glance, and then uh, operate the, or launch the instances from there. The advantage, of course, is this, um, Heat is an open stack native project. There's a couple of other good orchestrators out there. Um, but the downside is still that you have uh, every task that you write, every uh, let's say heat stack that you build, will have to know that it uh, needs to fall back to the remote uh, data center and to the remote uh, Swift cluster to get the data out. So 
we have, it's probably better, or it is better than scripted, but it is not perfect yet. So what I'm thinking about doing, and I'm hoping that I can get a little bit of feedback from people that have listened to my talk and have to have, that have seen the problems that we have in uh, real life, is um, whether it would make sense to have a multi backend glance. We have uh, other uh, projects that can have multiple backends. Cinder can have multiple backends. Glance cannot at the moment, and in my opinion, it should. It, we should be able to tell uh, to have Glance be, draw something from a local store and have a fallback store to draw an image from if uh, if it is not uh, there. So I am planning on uh, creating a blueprint, and uh, I'm really hoping that I can get some feedback from as many of you, uh, of you as possible on whether this whether uh, this approach from your point of view makes sense and uh, whether you would like to see that happen. I mean, this is what community is all about. We are not uh, talking about something that I'm imagining and coming up with because it's cool and because I think that I can have my name on a project. The idea is that uh, it is useful for the community, so we build it. And if this is not, if that's not the given, then uh, the community is not, or then, then the project is going to fail. We are not going to pull in any uh, developers, and it's not just not going to work. So we have about 30 minutes. I want to leave a few minutes for the question and answer. So what should you take for, from this talk? For the current uh, infrastructure, or for, the, for what, what currently exists, analyze your requirements and come up with a solution that best, best fits those requirements and then uh, go and uh, develop uh, around the drawbacks of the solution that you have. What's most importantly, religious wars always only leave victims on, all, uh, on the wayside. We have um, Seth versus Swift, we have Ubuntu versus Red Hat, we have uh, all kinds of religious wars, and I do not like to see any of them because uh, all the projects that we have in the open source space, most of them are, are very viable and are very good. And uh, working together, we can achieve a lot more than butting heads. I mean, if you see, if you walk in the mountains and you see those big horn sheep and they run together with the, with the, with their horns, and it's this is somehow what what this reminds me of. And then, yes, please show me your solutions. Uh, please let me know what, uh, uh, what you think of mine. And if somebody can come up with something better, I would be delighted to hear it. I'm uh, thinking about this project because it's, uh, it uh, is addressing problems that I currently have and that I see in the field time and again. And if we can find uh, a viable, tractable solution for all this, uh, I think this would be a, it would be a great thing to do. And OpenStack, I love OpenStack. I would, uh, like working with it. Uh, and I've, I think that within the last couple of years that I have been in OpenStack, we have uh, achieved absolutely amazing things. It's, uh, if I compare uh, OpenStack Folsom with uh, Kilo or what's uh, in, in store for Liberty, it's just, you know, it, it is like, like seeing uh, a number of uh, little, you know, little houses in a village we've been being blown up into a mega city. And I would like to work with others and uh, hear other opinions on that. Any questions or uh, comments that I could answer? Yes? So I'm, I'm curious uh, if Swift improved its performance how would your happy graph change? If Swift improved in performance, my happy graph would still look uh, roughly like this. The reason being that if it, it's, uh, at the moment you cannot replicate Swift uh, piece by piece. You cannot uh, basically being able to uh, say, okay, I'm only going to replicate this little thing here and this little thing there. That would, that would, um, that and the performance improvements 
would change the HAPI graph radic radically. The reason being at the moment that we have uh, uh, satellite data centers that have very little storage and that we want uh, to use as efficiently as possible and uh, not buy any additional storage for that. So this is, these are the two things that are, that are missing from my swift picture here. If we could get this going, that would of, of course also be a, a, a rather uh, very useful approach. And uh, I thought about the possibility of having separate SWIFT clusters, that, uh, but then you have the, the uh, same problem again, especially if the data sets between here, here, and here are not, simi not, not very similar. So you cannot say, okay, I'm, um, these are put together and we'll just sync this piece from the SWIFT cluster into the other SWIFT, SWIFT cluster. So uh, the, uh, the idea is still, Swift is good at a global replication of everything. I put something into it and it shows up magically on the other side. And I can still, this is another thing that I uh, absolutely forgot to mention before. Um, if you try the same thing with Ceph, theoretically you can. And if you have a very low latency and a very fast network, you, have, you can have OSDs in different geos. But uh, I have seen people try that and they invariably come back to the problem. This is just not fast enough. The latency is too high. The latency fluctuates. So Swift, you can write locally. You can have uh, write affinity and read affinity. So you get uh, your read data from your local uh, Swift cluster and you, get your, and you write to the local Swift cluster into temporary locations and after the fact the data is uh, being uh, replicated into the other uh, geo. So uh, this is the reason why Swift is good at geo replication and, uh, and Ceph is not. There's just different approaches to the same problem. Yes, this is something that is new in this is new in Kilo. I have not seen it yet. I have uh, heard about it. I have, uh, but um, I would love to t uh, love to test it, and that would certainly make a big difference in terms of how much storage you have to stuff into the thing. Another one. I understand that probably expense uh, make your solution a little more expensive. But did you ever think that really Swift need only two copies to be deployed before you return the right acknowledgement? So did you think for multiple data center, instead of putting Ceph as a local writing uh, destination, to put two copy in same data center and uh, make uh, the third copy in the remote data center? In this case, your proxy servers will uh, return the acknowledgement of writes uh, or reads as soon as first two copy will be, uh, will be returned and they will be locked. That approach is also something that I've thought about. Uh, the, the, the disadvantage to that is that it doesn't scale. If you have, yeah, uh, you have uh, two copies here and one copy here, you get, when, when, when you write into this one, you get uh, a write acknowledgement really quickly because you have the two local copies. If you write into this one, you always have a remote copy to talk to. to, talk to. And this is where write affinity and read affinity come in. This is their parameters that say, um, okay, I'm writing here, I have, a compute node here that's writing something into, into the Swift cluster. The compute node, um, uh, the, uh, the Swift cluster writes uh, enough copies to, uh, to generate a quorum. For instance, I have six copies total because I have two copies here, two copies here, and two copies here. And I, I get an act back as soon as the copies are written locally. This is, uh, I would have uh, four copies written locally. Two of them do not belong yeah. there. Yes, no, no. Uh, but then you recommend that your solution actually give the data uh, discrepancy to the scripts and the speed of local network uh, if you are putting it to scripting. Because you the, the much, uh, cannot guarantee the consistency between data centers because it's all up to the staff. Uh, it's all in the time frame that staff talking to Swift, Swift talking to Swift. Yes, uh, this is, that's what I, I think I. Uh, abbreviated that a little bit too much before. The idea is that the Ceph uh, data set is small and not, uh, not all that uh, dynamic. So uh, you're not, uh, this uh, Ceph cluster is not hammering that Swift cluster. It has a slow link between it, but if you only pull, some, pull, uh, pull data in it on a, a relatively moderate, at a relatively moderate pace, uh, you will not see the problem. The, the actual high speed access is going to be um, caught by the Ceph cluster. For instance, you have an object, an object that is being pulled from the Swift cluster 
once, and then you need it 50 times to, to uh, launch instances from it, from, a, from an image. So that uh, the amount of performance, or the, the performance that you need between here and here is comparatively small to what happens when, uh, when this thing, when, when all of my 50 instances try to boot immediately. So this is the reason why we cannot um, use the remote Swift cluster to do anything like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good question. Uh, thanks for bringing up the point about your blueprint, uh, like uh, taking the hybrid approach. So look forward to that and collaborating on that. Uh, one of the comments you made earlier was uh, building an elastic file system on Swift, and that approach does not work well. I agree with you. Do you think in your vision, uh, taking your hybrid approach uh, could allow building uh, Amazon-like uh, elastic file system on uh, using uh, that hybrid approach? using maybe Ceph? You mean uh, uh, replacing Swift with Ceph? Well, uh, basically building an elastic file system around uh, this storage technology. Um, sorry, sorry I'm, I'm drawing a blank. It's, just, it's been a very long day. Um, so you mean a file system that, is, that would be like CephFS or? Yeah, something like that. Right. Um, there are ways to do that on Swift. But uh, I think that the better approach, especially if you have uh, relatively small uh, data sets, I mean, a, a, a well-known, relatively well-known uh, paradigm in storage is, and paradigm is a tired word, but I apologize, and in this case, it, it makes, uh, in my opinion, makes sense, is that uh, you have, usually have a two or 3% active data set. You have a ton of uh, dormant data that is um, co essentially cold storage or warm storage, and then you have your little, uh, little hotspots. That's uh, why it probably makes more sense to use local Ceph clusters to do uh, the heavy lifting in terms of high performance. It's making Swift really fast is doable, but it uh, costs a lot of money. You have to have very fast um, uh, proxy servers. You have to have reasonably fast storage servers. You uh, can infuse SSD technology when, depending on what file system you're using. Uh, especially, this is another thing that I also for forgot to mention that I wanted to mention is one thing that one way to make Swift significantly faster is to take the uh, container database. The account database is not so important, but the container database is really important because every time you do a read or a write, the container database is hit. So put, taking this off, the regular ring and creating a separate ring for the container database, um, or rather to, um, um, detaching the container database ring from the from the object database from the object ring, and uh, writing into an SSD instead of into a uh, or a set of SSDs instead of a set of uh, spinning drives, uh, massively increases performance because otherwise you have uh, a number of for every access you have a number of seeks on spinning hard drives and that you know, you know how expensive that is. Yeah, just some context of the question. Given that when we keep either three copies or we keep or we do erasure coding, you're trying to protect against disk failure and controller failure. And, yes. and given that disk failure is orders of magnitude more than controller failures, uh, I'm just wondering, if, have you considered just traditional rated storage instead of Ceph? Uh, Yes, so and, the, and there's a good reason why we, are, why we are normally not doing it. Sorry, did, uh, I didn't cut you off today. Sure, no, no, no. Oh, okay. So um, the, 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 uh, I have had a number of customers who have tried that approach, and the approach was essentially to say, okay, we, instead of um, relying on Swift um, replicating three times, we are going to put a RAID behind it and replicating two times or even only one time. And uh, the problem really is if that RAID dies, and it has happened that the RAID dies, and it, uh, the reason is not only cannot only be disk failure, it can also be that just that storage node um, dies. Afterwards, you have to do replication work. If you lose a single disk, uh, you have a moderate amount of replication work. If you do a RAID of 10 disks, you have 10 times the replication traffic, and the replication traffic does not come from the same host. The replication traffic comes from some other host, and in some cases, if you have a multi-region setup, the replication traffic at least partly may even come from remote and uh, clog your lines. So the, uh, in most cases, using a RAID um, underlying the um, a Swift setup is not really um, an approach that has historically worked well. 
If you do it right, it may uh, have an advantage, but it can uh, also it can really come back to bite you. By the way, there is an interesting side sidelight to that that, uh, that I have seen. I have not actually seen a cluster that works that way, but uh, NetApp, for instance, has in their white paper, in the, in their um, architectural uh, design. They have uh, an option where you can use uh, NetApp E-Series SANS as backends for uh, Swift and have uh, potentially only, even only one copy. I currently have a customer who is trying just that. In my opinion, the risk is too high uh, because if you lose that uh, thing even temporarily, your cluster is going to be down. So if I was going to do that, I would have two um, set, uh, one set of storage nodes that get mounts from two uh, E-series devices and have a replication factor of two, so every, every uh, bit of data is going to be replicated between those. It's not quite as cheap. You're still sa saving, let's say, um, one third or so of storage capacity. You can have higher density because, or may have, may be able to have higher density. But from, a, um, I, I really want to see it work. I want to see that customer uh, finish it up, and maybe at the next summit uh, I can report on how how this is. Uh, going to work. Technically, it's possible. But I personally, at the, po at the point where we are right now, I would at least not do it with standard disks. Failure will cause data loss. So you're saying controller failure is what you want to predict against, right? Yes. So okay. this is, uh, if you, the, the more uh, individual paths you have to the, to, uh, to the data items, the less likely you are to cause a replication storm. And the replication storm is what kills you. You can, buy, you can build a marvelous cluster, a marvelous um, Swift setup, a marvelous Cepheus setup. What really, what really uh, uh, breaks you is not standard operation. It is the invariable thing that something goes wrong. And this is, it will happen at some point. You may be happy for a while, and it will happen at some point. So that's, this is why I always adv uh, advocate plan for failure. Think, sit down and think what is going to, whatever design you have, sit down and think what is going to happen to my design if this fails, if that fails. And if you go through your exercise and you think, okay, this is the right, uh, right approach, then this is what you should implement. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes.